topic today is calculating CO2. We frequently hear about carbon, CO2 and emissions and often the terms are used interchangeably. This can be confusing for people starting out with energy efficiency when in reality energy efficiency doesn't have to be related to carbon and emissions. Often it's more about the amount, cost and effective use of energy. So today we'll focus on some of these questions. Why do we talk about CO2? What does the E mean? Why do we calculate it at all? How you might go about it? What standards you might use? And then we'll look at some conversion of uh, activity data. So we'll start with Kevin. Why do we talk about carbon or carbon footprints at all? Well, what we really mean is CO2. Uh, CO2 in the atmosphere has been a proven cause of climate change. CO2 in the atmosphere means that the Earth absorbs more heat from the sun than it re-radiates back to space. So applying our principles of energy balancing again, that extra energy remaining behind must cause the temperature to rise. While we do all exhale CO2 into the atmosphere, this is all just part of the natural carbon cycle and is dealt with quite well. However, burning fossil fuels produces so much CO2 that it just swamps this natural carbon cycle. Uh, and therefore, this is what's the cause of concern that's causing the rapid rise in temperature. The main source of this carbon dioxide is the burning of fuels other than hydrogen, of course. Um, and so these are, this is our main concern. But there are other factors which are involved as well. So what does the E mean? Well, the E is significant because CO2 is not the only greenhouse gas. Various greenhouse gases have different characteristics such as their capacity to trap heat. Um, and so, for example, uh, methane has a global warming potential of 25. Nitrous oxide has a global warming potential of 298. So a tonne of methane in the air has the same global warming potential as 25 tonnes of CO2. And a tonne of nitrous oxide, the same as 298 tonnes of CO2. Um, note that the graphic on the screen um, shows a GWP of 21 for methane. Uh, this was taken from the, the second assessment reported in the Governmental Panel on Climate Change, while 25 is taken from the fourth assessment report. These factors are periodically updated. So if you're doing accurate work, make sure you've checked you've got the right factors. So Chris, why would a business bother working out their GHG emissions, and typically how would they go about it? Yeah, there's a number of drivers uh, that would, you know, cause a business to to want to go down this path of calculating their carbon emissions. Uh, they might want to try and improve their processes, so they're looking at the intensity of their process and how they can uh, better manage that. They might want to lower their energy and resource costs, uh, or identify waste and the impacts of their extended supply chain. They might want to try and understand their exposure to the risks of climate change and to demonstrate management of environmental issues to investors, clients and stakeholders, which is becoming increasingly important. Uh, the, another driver might be staff retention. Some people like working for uh, companies that are doing something about their environmental impact. Uh, it, can, it can help to manage uh, volatile energy and commodity prices, so there's a direct correlation between carbon emissions, energy use and resource use. And of course, these all have associated costs with them. Uh, that can lead to new business opportunities. Um, often we see uh, government tenders going out and there's a 20% waiting for people who have done something about this. Uh, it can be a competitive advantage uh, over, over people in the same space. So if you've, if you've done something about this, then uh, you can often be uh, uh, seen as a market leader. And you can use it for brand enhancement as well, so it can, can quite, be quite a good uh, marketing opportunity. In terms of actually coming up with the numbers, uh, there's a couple of different ways you can do it. And the graphic there shows um, a, a life cycle approach. So this basically focuses on a product and, uh, or a, a particular product or service, and it, it takes into account all the upstream and downstream impacts from the extraction and supply of raw materials to the production process, the delivery, to the end user and disposal. So it's sometimes called a cradle to gate or a cradle to grave assessment. 
and uh, and it really requires quite an in-depth study of the supply chain, as you can imagine, and as well as you need to have access to very sophisticated software that actually gives you the conversion numbers of these different elements into uh, carbon dioxide equivalent. But this type of assessment also gets used to assess other impacts, such as water and land use disturbance. The international standard which prescribes the appropriate processes to follow for the assessment of life cycle greenhouse gas emissions of goods and services is called PAS 2050-2008. So another way to do it, uh, it's a bit less onerous than, than doing a full life cycle assessment is uh, just calculating the, the um, operational carbon footprint of an organisation. This is basically known as a greenhouse gas assessment. So in order to conduct a greenhouse gas assessment, both the organisational and operational boundaries have to be set. And the GHG protocol is a universally recognised standard in setting these boundaries. And it gives organisations consistency when accounting for and setting the scope of their emissions. Basically, a GHG assessment separates emissions into three scope levels, scope one, scope two, scope three. And the separation of scopes ensures that no double accounting occurs. Chris, a lot of acronyms are bandied about and we often hear things like GHG protocol, uh, NCOS, NGERS, uh, the NGA and you mentioned PAS before as one of the standards. Um, what are the main ones a business should know about and how do they all fit together? Well, the main ones as I mentioned are the GHG protocol, that's pretty much a fundamental um, and it's internationally recognised standard for conducting these sort of assessments and it's developed by the World Business Council for Sustainable Development and the World Resources Institute. They use the expertise of representatives from both the financial and technical sectors to develop these guidelines. Um, then there's the National Carbon Offset Standard or NCOS as it's also known and this is a government regulated program which allows organisations to certify their products, services and operations as carbon neutral. Um, and this was basically, you know, put forward to, to give people a sort of a uniformity and, and create credibility and transparency in this area because a lot of people say they're carbon neutral but may not be certified as such. Then there's the National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Scheme, ENGAS, and that's a legislative requirement to report uh, annual greenhouse gas emissions as well as energy production and consumption for organisations that meet specific thresholds. Uh, and the Clean Energy Regulator administers the ENGAS scheme and that basically feeds into the carbon price um, that I'm sure you're all aware of. And the main difference between the ENGAS scheme and the NCOS scheme is that ENGAS only accounts for scope one and two, whereas NCOS includes scope three as well. And how do you convert activity data into GHG emissions and where do the emission factors come from? Well, converting data now, activity data into carbon dioxide equivalent is usually simply a case of multiplying one number by another. Uh, for example, a kilowatt hour of electricity use is equal to a specific amount of emissions and the primary source of emission factors in Australia is the National Greenhouse Account Factors or NGA factors. And these are freely available on the web uh, and they're updated annually. The most current version of the NGA factors has a scope 2 emission factor for electricity consumed in New South Wales of 0 0.87 kilograms CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour. So if you have an annual consumption of 250,000 kilowatt hours, the following calculation applies. 250,000 times 0 0.87 divided by 1,000 equals 217.5 tonnes carbon dioxide equivalent. If you want to look at other activities, uh, they might be a bit more difficult to estimate because sources for emission factors are less readily available. Basically the NGA factors cover things like electricity, gas, fuel, waste, uh, refrigerants, that sort of thing. Uh, but if you want to go beyond that and look at paper use or water consumption or flights um, or the embodied emissions in the equipment that you're using and the materials that you use, it gets a bit harder. So a business might want to convert its energy use into emissions using the CO2 equivalent unit of measure and this can be useful for identifying environmental risks in the supply chain, benchmarking against other businesses and can also be used as a broad measure of energy consumption. 
Uh, today we've run through some of the calculations using the GWP conversion factors and we've outlined how some of the key standards and guidelines apply.